There are a few things that I'd like to talk about with regard to network routing concepts um, before we get further into our development of uh, concepts around user experience. So this lecture is Network Routing Concepts. I'm D Professor Don Patterson. At a high level, what we'd like to cover in this lecture is just the um, knowledge that we need to know about how requesting a web resource leverages a whole network of computers. We know that a URL has a domain name, and that domain name translates into an IP address. It appears like that's just one computer. But in fact, in order to get the resource associated with the URL, we have to work with several different computers that are in a network. And each one of those computers along the way has its own IP address. Depending on which scheme we use in our URL, HTTP or HTTPS, for example, the way that the networks get used and the way the path gets constructed is slightly different. And in the, you've seen in the news recently, there's been a lot of discussion about privacy and um, the ability to for different organizations and different actors to get information on the Internet. Edward Snowden's release, in particular, um, of top-secret U.S. information made it clear that there are a lot of entities out there, that, out there that are trying to get our data. So this will give you a little bit of a mental model for how that might happen um, and how that interacts with designing networked applications. So in the abstract, an abstract internet, we think about the fact that maybe we have some kind of an app running on a smartphone. It sends and receives data. Maybe it's messages, maybe it's images, whatever it might be. And somewhere out there, there's a web server. We kind of suspect there's a computer that's run by Instagram or Facebook, WhatsApp, whatever the organization is. And when we make requests, sending data or requesting data to that web server, it goes vaguely through the internet. It gets there, it comes back. We know there's a lot of complications there, but maybe we don't necessarily know what's going on. We just think of it as a big cloud. Well, if we peel back the covers a little bit, if we, if we turn, peel back the curtains a little bit, and we look inside and we see what the um, network really looks like, we can see something that's a little bit less abstract. So here's an example of uh, what it takes in order to get a packet from my phone, an app on my phone, using the Verizon network in order to get to a web server located at UCI. And what you can see is that there are about 15 different computers along the way. Each one of those boxes in the diagram actually corresponds to a computer that touches my message on the way from my phone to the web server. In the black box, what you can see is a list of the names of each of the computers that are working to get my message where it needs to go. Some of the names are just IPv4 addresses, four different numbers. Uh, between 0 and 255. And then some of them have domain names that look a little bit like they're just domain, their IPv4 addresses as well, but actually because they have some words in them, they're domain name address. So for example, the first computer that touches my packet on the way off of my phone has an IP address of 172.20.10.1. But if you look down at like the 15th uh, touch on my packet on the way to UCI, you can see that computer has the name UCI dash dash TUS dash dash etc cetera, etc cetera, dot C E N I C dot net. So along the way you can see indications of different organizations that own the network. You've got something that looks like myverizonwireless.com owning the first looks like seven hops along the way. Then it looks like the packages are passed off to some company called Zio, who I don't know anything about. Number 11 is unknown. We know it's IP address, but doesn't have a domain name, so we're not sure who that belongs to. Then we've got four different computers that appear to be owned by an organization called Scenic before it arrives at UCI. So when we send data, that data gets broken up into a bunch of packets on our phone, and it leaves our phone, and it's passed from one computer to the next computer all the way till it gets to the other web server. Each one of these computers along the way is owned by a different organization, and doesn't just connect to the other computers on this path, but connects to many different computers as well, in case I wanted to go to a different web server or a different phone wanted to contact UCI. So likewise, when I want to request data and that data comes back from UCI, it follows the path back as well. It may be the same path or it may be a different path, depending on whether or not the internet has changed. For example, those computers could go offline, or perhaps there's a lot of congestion along one of the routes. And just like taking a different um, road, if a, a car traffic uh, congestion occurs, packets can also take a different um, path uh, on the way back from a server, or even on multiple trips to the same server, different paths might be utilized. In any event, it travels along all those different hops and all the way back. An IPv4 address is usually in a URL 
either the domain name or the IPv4 address, specifies just the web server. The internet takes care of making sure that all these computers along the way pass your packet along to the ultimate destination. That's the path that the network takes. But we also know that each URL has a scheme or a protocol that describes how that, how that data is formulated on the way. And so far we've talked about two, HTTP and HTTPS. Those are both protocols that both the smartphone or the client has to work with as well as the web server or the server, say client and server. So the server also has to be communicating the same way. So if we're communicating via HTTP, what that means is it means that there's an agreement about how data is passed along the computer to the web server. And one of the things about the data that's passed along the way is it's like a postcard in the sense that any of the information that's in that packet that's being passed along can be read by any of the computers along the way just like any postman who is so inclined could look at the back of a postcard and see the message that's on the back of it. So in HTTP, your data is visible all along the path from your computer to the web server. And so in this way, if someone was interested in looking at the contents of your web traffic, they could work with any one of those computers along the way, or with any one of the organizations, or maybe with a computer that has a question mark on it that you're not sure what that computer is. And they could look or record any of the information that's present in a packet that's being sent from a phone to a server. So every computer can see what's being passed along the way if it's on the route. And that's one of the weaknesses of the HTTP protocol. On the other hand, a lot of the web surfing that we do is fairly innocuous. It's not particularly interesting that you're checking, um, maybe, uh, an, um, you know, checking to see what a menu at a restaurant is or checking to see what the traffic is. Those, those things, just in general, probably aren't very um, critical, certainly not a secret, and so encrypting them is not really that important. Now, if you're interested in being able to find or to see the path that your packets are taking, you can use a tool like Traceroute. Traceroute is a command that you run on a command line interface in a terminal window or command window. And the way you run it is you type the command Traceroute. It varies a little bit from platform to platform. And then you specify the destination that you're interested in tracing the route from. Now, where you run this command really matters. Because whether if you're running it from a computer, the route that's going to be traced is from your computer to the destination. There are some web services that allow you to run trace route from the web service. But typically what those services do is they don't trace the route from your computer to the destination. They trace the route from the web server to the destination. So that we don't have a, this picture doesn't really describe that very well. So in this case here, you can see that I'm executing a, a trace route command, trying to find all the computers along the way between um, my location here today, actually, and UCI. And you can see several of the names of the um, servers along the way. Um, of interest, perhaps, is number 12. The firewall for UCI is called Kazadum, which is a reference to Lord of the Rings. Another command that you can use is called MTR. Um, MTR is a trace route command that repeats itself over and over again and collects statistics about the route. Now on my computer, I can't just run MTR by itself, I have to run it as root, and so I have to preface it with the sudo command. But when you run the MTR command, it's very similar. I use the dash T option in order to just get text output. And what you can see is very much a similar information, but rather than just having one path, uh, just watching the package just go from the source to the destination, one time for each hop, this MTR repeatedly tries to um, evaluate the path so that you can look at things like uh, the um, number of times packets are being lost by computers along the way or how much time it's taking to get to each computer. If you use MTR and you try and find the path to another computer, say, on the other side of the world, you can look and see how much time it's taking to get to each hop and you can evaluate when it's crossing oceans, for example because uh, you'll see that there's a big jump in the amount of time it takes to get from maybe hop 6 to 7 or 8 to 9. Um, finally, you can use some GUI-based tools. Um, on the Mac platform, you can use a tool called Network Utility, and there's a tab on that in which you can run Traceroute. And every platform has a um, graphical user interface version of these tools as well. Um, depending on which one you're working with, you might have to um, do a little bit of research to find out which one you can use. They all, under the, um, under the hood, use the same uh, technology to find the route from one location to another. Now, HTTP is not the only protocol that you can use. Um, you can use HTTPS as well. 
Now, the advantage of HTTPS is that the information that's being sent from one side to the other is encrypted in flight. And so in this diagram, we show that that encryption is happening by putting X's over the data. And what that means is as the data is going from one location to another, the computers along the way only know the destination that that packet is supposed to go to. They don't know anything about the contents of it. And so in that way, HTTPS is more like sending an envelope through the postal mail in which you can see the destination that it's going to and perhaps the return address, but you don't really know any of the information on the inside of the envelope. And you can't get to it unless you open, open the envelope. Opening the envelope in the postal system is, protect, is prevented through legal means. On the internet, HTTPS is prevented from being opened by encryption. And so there basically is a sophisticated password uh, mechanism that needs to be utilized in order to open up the contents of that uh, data packet. HTTPS actually is the name for several different protocols. Um, and the most secure right now is one called HTTPS with perfect forward secrecy. And what this means is it means that even if someone records the traffic from one location to another, and is at some point in the future able to identify, um, able to um, get your password, they're not able to um, look arbitrarily at any packets that you've sent before um, in order to encrypt them. They can only see them from the time, the time at which they break the code forward. So in this case, it's also encrypted along the way. It's just encrypted with a higher sophisticated in level of encryption. Which level of encryption is being used when you type HTTPS into a browser? Well, that depends largely on the web server. The web server is responsible for de deciding what the level of security is that it's going to support. Um, TLS, which is one of the names of the encryption, version 1.2, is the one that has perfect forward secrecy. HTTP and HTTPS, and HTTPS with perfect forward secrecy, all rely on an underlying mechanism called sockets. And sockets, uh, the level of sockets is where the path is being created from one side to the other. You may also come across the terms TCP and UDP. These are also lower level mechanisms for how we form the path from one side to another and move uh, the packets along the path without talking about um, how the information that's in them is being, is being stored. So if you look at the security of some websites, for example, you can know when you go to a website, for example, UCI's website, if it's prefaced with the scheme HTTP, that any information that's being sent back and forth between your browser on your computer and the remote web server, any of the computers along the way are able to read that. So in this case, they're able to see what search terms I enter in. They're able to see what responses UCI passes back. If I enter any messages or contact information or help information, any queries I enter, that can all be read by people in, along the way. Very insecure. All content can be seen in transit. But again, maybe this isn't the most sensitive um, website in the world. Maybe it would be more sensitive if you were working with your doctor or with your hospital. Maybe if you're communicating with uh, the New York Times or you're interested in talking to um, some um, an insurance company. All those things might be more sensitive, in which case you might be more interested in making sure that HTTPS is being used. Now, um, not too long ago, in October of 2015, we did an evaluation of UCI's website using the secure protocol, HTTPS. It had very moderate security and no forward secrecy at that time and basically got an overall rating of a C. But since the revelations around Edward Snowden and the NSA wiretapping, many web servers, many organizations have been incre increasing uh, the quality of their security on their HTTPS servers. And UCI is no different. Because as of recently, in March of 2017, uh, HTTPS at UCI had been improved, getting a grade of A because it has high security and now perfect forward secrecy in its encryption as well. So good for UCI. Not surprisingly, if you go to the National Security Agency, uh, this website also uses high security and perfect forward secrecy as well. I mean, it is possible to get an A+, and that would be the case if there were more sophisticated um, ciphers being used, but it's not the case here. If you're interested in checking the security, there's um, a variety of good online tools that you can use to check the security of a web server. This is a particularly good one, www.ssllabs.com, sslTestIndex.html. And if you look on the left, that's the, brow that's the interface that you'll get, and you can type in the destination of a web server that you would like to test for security. In this case, I entered in an IP address for google.com, and again, in October of 15, even Google was only getting a B for security. But as of more recently, they have also upgraded their security to a higher level 
getting a grade of an A from SSL Lab. Side note, um, in addition to web servers increasing their security, clients have also improved their security. And so on any iOS apps that are being written today, if they use any URLs in their communication, by default, I, an app is not able to communicate with a remote web server unless HTTPS with perfect forward secrecy is being used. In order to allow a native iOS application that you're writing to access resources on the internet with URLs, the web server must utilize HTTPS with TLS version 1.2, or perfect forward secrecy. In order to get your native iOS app to use something lower than that, you have to specifically request an exception, and a security exception from your application. Now don't confuse this with using the Safari web browser. If you use the Safari web browser in an iOS application, you're still able to get lower security content just like you could in any web browser. But for native applications, maybe ones that you would write in the future, uh, you need to work with web servers that are using higher security. And that's with good reason. So one side effect of using HTTP in an environment in which security is important is that sometime web services will automatically upgrade your, your security. Um, autom well, sometimes web services on your connection will automatically upgrade your web security. So for example, if you go to the privacy, um, the website duckduckgo.com, it's a search engine. It's a search engine that differentiates itself by being particularly privacy aware. And if you go to that website using the HTTP scheme, it will automatically upgrade you to the HTTPS scheme in order to protect your traffic along the way. And you can see that happening here as I enter in DuckDuckGo into my browser, and the response is that the, the search engine comes up, but it upgrades my connection to HTTPS. Generally, is that good or is that bad? Well, it is good for a browser. It's good in the sense that a user that doesn't understand security that enters in HTTP will automatically get a secure connection. But for APIs, and by that I mean for connections that maybe a native application uses with a web service to get resources on the other end of a URL, first accessing that resource using HTTP can expose information just on that very first connection that's made to the web server. So for example, in this URL, a URL that has a host name and a parameter on the query of access token equals 039450, that parameter, when it's first sent in HTTP, can be viewed by any of the computers along the way. Even if the connection is subsequently increased to HTTPS, now that that information has been sent in the clear, some of that connection could possibly be compromised. Subsequent traffic will be encrypted, but some information has already been exposed. So what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is if you're building applications for a user and the content could at all be considered um, sensitive, and that's something that has to be taken with a very conservative eye, uh, you shouldn't rely on that redirect. You should always use HTTPS URLs, if possible, from the beginning. It's a simple, simple security hygiene um, um, best known method. So, in summary, talking about basic network routing concepts. We know that when we access a resource on the internet using a uniform resource locator, a URL, there's only one IP address that's present in that URL. But in order to get to that destination, we actually have to touch many different computers along the way. Each one has its own IP addresses, address, and in some cases they also have their own domain name. Each computer passes the message with best effort possible, passes the message along to the ultimate destination. Different schemes and protocols will use that path in different ways in order to send the message either encrypted or unencrypted, different patterns and protocols of ways in which information is transported over that path. We saw HTTP and HTTPS in particular as two that are going to be most interesting um, to us. Finally, um, the path to a resource can vary. It's not always the same, even in a, in a connection with a web, web server. It can vary over time and even over just the course of loading one web page. Usually, though, you don't have to think about it very much. The Internet regularly does a good job of getting your packets back and forth to where they need to go, using the computers in, in between, and you don't really have to think about that path too much. It's abstracted away. So the path, it, the path that your package uses is also something that's independent from the scheme. So forming a path and then deciding what scheme to use over that path are two different things. So you can, you can make those decisions about the, well, the decision for the path is usually made for you. 
But the decision about what scheme to make can be made independently of which path is ultimately being used. I hope that these ideas about network routing, about the computers that are present along the way, and a little bit of familiarity with the tools of how to expose what that path is will help you build more robust web services. Thank you.